on Friday the 13th of February, 1942, 28-year-old Royal Air Force Air Cadet Gordon Frederick Cummings, a married man with no prior convictions, was arrested and charged with causing grievous bodily harm to 30-year-old Greta Haywood in a suspected robbery in a back street just off Piccadilly Circus. Faced with insurmountable evidence, including an accurate description which identified Cummings as her attacker, having had drinks with him barely an hour before, her home telephone number, written in her handwriting, which was found inside his greatcoat pocket, and his military-issued gas respirator, discovered at the scene of the crime, inside which he had written his RAF serial number, 525987. A number so unique, it led police directly to Cummings, who apologised, feigned memory loss, blamed the incident on drink, and would be remanded in custody at Brixton Prison until his court appearance. With the trial being a legal formality, no loose ends to tie up, and the investigation into Greta Haywood being short, neat and complete, the Metropolitan Police could focus their efforts on more pressing matters, such as a murder. As on two consecutive days, on two different streets in London's West End, two unrelated women, Evelyn Hamilton and Evelyn Oatley, had been strangled, mutilated and posed by a serial sexual sadist in two sickening and unnervingly similar attacks. With their attacker's fingerprints not on record, no eyewitnesses to either murder, and the victim's last known movements being uncertain, the police knew they had to catch him quick before he struck again. But little did they know that he had already murdered two other women, Margaret Florence Lowe and Doris June, whose bodies were yet to be discovered and that the police had already caught the Blackout Ripper. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, this is Murder Mile, and I present to you part seven of the full, true and untold story of the Blackout Ripper. Today, I'm standing outside the Central Criminal Court, more affectionately known as the Old Bailey, which stands on the medieval grounds of the infamous execution site of Newgate Prison, on the junction of Hoban Viaduct and Newgate Street. Destroyed by fire and rebuilt between 1902 and 1907, the new Old Bailey is a stunning Georgian courthouse made from sculpted blocks of pale Portland stone, designed in an imposing neo-baroque style, and stood on top of its 67-foot domed roof is a shimmering bronze statue of Lady Justice, a beacon of truth, with a sword in her right hand, scales in her left hand, and although she's supposed to be blindfolded, as Justice is meant to be blind, Lady Justice isn't as apparently, in the eyes of the sculptor, all ladies are fair, honest, and unbiased. <laughs> and although, as Britain's most high-profile court, it's hosted such sensational murder trials as Dr. Crippen, the Cray Twins, Ruth Ellis, and the Yorkshire Ripper, Today, its oak panelled chambers mostly echo to the sounds of big business ducking hefty tax bills, failed pop stars insisting that they only snort sherbet, having recently been diagnosed with a severe sugar addiction, billionaires paying for the privilege to build a penis shaped penthouse which overlooks Buckingham Palace, having previously been denied a passport and undeniably dull TV nobodies, suppressing salacious news stories about their nightly love sessions with a royal, 
a tub of butter, a ring piece, and a large root vegetable. Mm. But it was here, on Monday the 27th of April 1942, in the bomb-damaged remains of the Old Bailey, that London's most prolific spree killer would be tried for murder. As Gordon Frederick Cummings sat in his prison cell, smoking and smirking, Something just didn't sit right with Detective Inspector Clarence Jeffrey. As although the assault on Greta Hayward was clear-cut, several unnervingly similar events of the case sent a cold shiver down his spine. Although the attack took place at night and in private, which many in the West End do, Cummings stole cash from Greta's handbag. And yet, according to her testimony, his wallet was stuffed full with close to 30 one-pound notes, an amount that was considerably more than his fortnightly wage. During the unprovoked attack on Greta, he didn't shove, kick, punch, or even threaten her with a weapon. Instead, he strangled her with his left hand. A slow and sadistic method of attack, rarely used by robbers and muggers, which is more akin to murderers and rapists. And across his middle fingers were the bloody scabs of an injury, easily more than a few hours old, but most probably a few days. And upon his arrest, not only did Cummings have in his possession a gold watch, a silver cigarette case, and a greeny-blue comb with several teeth missing, none of which he said he owned, had seen before, or could account as to why they were in his pockets. But in the bright lights of West End Central Police Station, Several blood splashes were visible on his brown shirt and blue tunic. And although she was bruised and unconscious, Greta Hayward didn't bleed. So whose was the blood? On the morning of Friday the 13th of February 1942, at around the same time that Cummings was arrested, feisty Paddington prostitute Catherine Mulcahy was examined by Dr. Alexander Baldy, who confirmed that her injuries were consistent with strangulation. Giving the police a detailed description of her attacker, which was corroborated by her neighbours, Agnes Morris and Kitty McQuillan, and exactly matched Gordon Frederick Cummings, having handed in the missing blue belt to his RAF tunic, on which were two specks of blood. Feeling that the assaults on Greta Hayward and Catherine Mulcahy required further investigation, they were escalated to Chief Inspector Edward Greeno, one of the West End's most senior detectives, who also headed up the murder investigation into Evelyn Hamilton and Evelyn Oatley. But before Chief Inspector Greeno could even begin to consider Cummings as a viable suspect to two assaults and two unnervingly similar murders, two more bodies would be found. At 4.30pm, having broken down the locked bedroom door at flat 4 at numbers 9-10 to 10 Gosfield Street, Detective Sergeant Leonard Blacktop discovered 43-year-old Margaret Florence Lowe. Her left-handed attacker had strangled her, posed the body, mutilated her using a variety of readily available household objects, and although rape hadn't occurred, he had violated her with a candle. Cash was taken, personal items were stolen, and once again, 
no one saw her murder or her murderer. And even though Superintendent Frederick Cheryl of Scotland Yard's Print Bureau had found three sets of his fingerprints, one on the base of the candlestick, one on the bottle in the kitchen, and one on the half-full glass of stout, which Margaret and her killer had shared, which he had then left on the mantelpiece. Her killer couldn't be identified, as with Cummings having been arrested for the first time that very morning, and his assault charge still pending, his fingerprints had yet to be put on file. At 7.50pm, having broken down the locked bedroom door to flat 1 at 187 Sussex Gardens, PC Payne discovered 32-year-old Doris Elizabeth Junet. Her left-handed attacker had strangled her, posed the body, and mutilated her using a variety of readily available household objects. But this time, he hadn't raped or violated her, as through sheer fear, she had wet herself. Cash was taken, personal items were stolen, and once again, no one saw her murder or her murderer. And although no fingerprints were found, Home Office Chief Pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury, who conducted all four autopsies on Evelyn Hamilton, Evelyn Oatley, Margaret Florence Lowe and Doris Junet, confirmed that it was highly likely that all four murders had been committed by one man. There was no denying it. London's West End was in the grip of a serial sexual sadist and spree killer who had murdered four women in just four days and with the press getting wind of the story the police had to catch the blackout ripper before he struck again. But Chief Inspector Greeno already had a prime suspect in his sights and better still he already had him locked up in prison. On Saturday the 14th of February 1942, Detective Inspector Freshney interviewed Cummings at Brixton Prison to ascertain his whereabouts between Sunday the 8th and Thursday the 12th of February. And although the prisoner appeared pleasant, charming and helpful, his answers were deliberately vague and evasive. In summary, Cummings stated that these were his movements. Sunday the 8th of February, the night that Evelyn Hamilton was murdered. Cummins visited his wife in Barnes, South London, said goodbye to her at 6pm, took a bus and a tube to Baker Street, headed to his flat at St James's Court, and was in bed by 10pm. There is no mention of Maison Lyonnaise, Marble Arch or Montague Place in his statement. Monday the 9th of February, the night that Evelyn Oatley was murdered. Being on duty all day, he left his flat at just after 6pm, headed into Piccadilly with a red-headed corporal, got drunk, met two prostitutes later identified as Laura Denmark and Molly de Santos Alves, and headed back to his flat after midnight. And although partially true, there is no mention of Wardour Street in his statement. Tuesday the 10th of February. No known murders were committed by the Blackout Ripper that night. But being on duty all day, he finished at 6pm, went to the YMCA bar and he was in bed by 9.30pm. Wednesday the 11th of February the night Margaret Florence Lowe was murdered. Being on duty all day, he finished at 6pm, went to the YMCA bar, and was in bed by 9.30pm. 
There is no mention of Piccadilly Circus, Soho or Gosfield Street in his statement. Thursday the 12th of February, the night of Doris Junet's murder and the attacks on Greta Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy. Being on duty all day, he left his flat just after 6pm, headed to the volunteer public house by Baker Street with a red-headed corporal, got drunk, headed into Piccadilly, met Greta Haywood at Brasserie Universelle, but he doesn't remember much after that. He ended up in bed with an unknown prostitute in Paddington, believed to be Doreen Lytton, arrived back at Abbey Lodge at 4.30am and was detained by the orderly corporal prior to the arrival of the police. In his statement, Cummings deliberately admitted to only being in the places where he knew he had been seen. He avoids any reference to the murder locations and by repeatedly stating that he returned to his billets before curfew on all the other nights. With all of the air cadets at Abbey Lodge and St James's Close being unfamiliar with each other's names, faces and movements, having met barely one week before, he knew that the chance of anyone accurately confirming his precise whereabouts across that whole week in a major metropolitan city at wartime and during the blackout, would be slim. With an incomplete timeline and no witnesses to accurately corroborate his whereabouts, the police were relying on one vital piece of evidence to either confirm or deny his story. The logbook. As an active military installation working under tight wartime conditions. The Royal Air Force dictated that no person was permitted to leave his or her station without signing in or out of the logbook first, using their name, rank and serial number, all of which was cross-checked using their military ID card in a visual inspection by an armed sentry. It was supposed to be a foolproof system. But with security amongst the cadets being lax, with many airmen signing in or out for each other, stuffing their beds with clothes to thwart the midnight bed check, and accessing their flats by an unguarded fire escape which led directly from the ground floor, often the logbook, into which you could write in either pen or pencil, was incomplete. When Detective Inspector Freshney examined each page of the logbook for Cummings' whereabouts, his heart almost stopped dead. The page for Saturday the 7th of February had been torn out. The page for Sunday the 8th had no entry for Cummings. On Monday the 9th he had signed out at 6.20 but never signed in. The pages for Tuesday the 10th of February and Wednesday the 11th of February had no entry for Cummings at all. And on Thursday the 12th of February, he had signed out at 6.29, but never signed back in. Wherever Gordon Frederick Cummings was, during that week, was a mystery. Which couldn't be unravelled by relying on eyewitness testimony or military records. And so far, in terms of conviction, the police had a lot of circumstantial evidence, but very little which would stick. With Cummins almost certain to be charged with causing the grievous bodily harm of Greta Haywood, the police's next steps were to confirm that Cummings, on the same night, had attacked Catherine Mulcahy and to prove that both attacks were connected and that this left-hander was a serial strangler. And no matter how small, slim or seemingly insignificant, the overworked and understaffed detectives of the Metropolitan Police Force 
had to scrutinise every single piece of evidence they had, starting with his clothes, the spare gas respirator, and his money. On Sunday the 15th of February, Cummings' Royal Air Force uniform were removed from Brixton Prison and having spotted 13 small bloodstains on the shirt and the belt, they were sent to the police laboratory in Hendon for an examination which would take four days. Having traced Paddington prostitute Doreen Lytton, she confirmed that she had met Cummings in Piccadilly at roughly 2am on Friday the 13th of February, had gone back to her flat in Polygon Mews, and that she had given him her spare gas respirator, having found it the Saturday before. With its original owner having inked his army serial number of 823863 inside the gas mask, police confirmed it belonged to gunner Aubrey John King of the 96th Field Regiment, who had lost it back in November 1941 and was stationed in Clacton-on-Sea, 70 miles away, during the full duration of the murders, ruling him out as a suspect. Upon his arrest, Cummings had £10 in his possession, £2 in his wallet and £8 in the spare gas respirator. But also, that evening, he had given Catherine Mulcahy 10 one pound notes, two pounds on Regent Street, three pounds in the taxi, and five pounds as an apology for attempting to strangle her, which she handed to the police as evidence. According to the paymaster's records, Cummings received his fortnightly wage of 12 pounds on Saturday the 1st of February which was distributed by Pilot Officer John Rowan from a fresh block of 500 one-pound notes that he himself had withdrawn from the bank that very morning, meaning the serial numbers on the notes were all in an unbroken sequential order. On Sunday the 8th of February, six days before his next payday, with Cummings being broke, he was only able to borrow one pound off his wife. But by Monday the 9th, Felix Sands LeBron James, the red-headed corporal who Cummings had treated to pints and whiskies that night in Piccadilly, noted that he had £19 on him. And yet, Cummings had no savings, no loans, no debts owing, no inheritance, and no other source of funds. With the paymaster, Having distributed each wage in alphabetical order, Pilot Officer Rowan checked the remaining banknotes of any cadet whose surname began with the letters B, C and D and was able to accurately determine what the serial numbers of Cummings' banknotes would have been. The police cross-checked the serial numbers of the banknotes in evidence and confirmed that of his original £12 wage, one one-pound note was found in the bundle of eight which was stashed inside the spare gas respirator along with the gold watch. Two one-pound notes were given to Catherine Mulcahy and a further two were found in the daily takings at Brasserie Universal and the Salted Almond. Without a shred of doubt, the police could prove that Cummings had strangled two women, Greta Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy, on the same night. Now they just needed to piece together a picture of his movements that week, and to prove that Gordon Frederick Cummings was the Blackout Ripper. At 6.30pm on Saturday the 14th of February 1942, Detective Sergeant Leonard Crawford searched Flat 27 at St James's Close in Regent's Park. On his bunk in Room B, he found Cummings' kit bag, which was marked with his rank and surname, L.A.C. Cummings. And he found his spare blue tunic, which was missing a blue belt. In the left pocket of which 
was his identity discs etched with his serial number of 525987. And in his right breast pocket, D.S. Crawford found a black fountain pen engraved with the initials of D.J. On a hunch, Chief Inspector Greeno asked the victims next of kin to identify three personal items found in Cummings' possession. Margaret Florence Lowe's 15-year-old daughter, Barbara, confirmed that the silver cigarette case was her mother's. And Henri June, Doris's husband, identified the greeny-blue comb with several teeth missing as Doris's, as well as the gold wristwatch which he had brought in France in 1927 and had gifted to his wife on their wedding anniversary just four years prior. Now nothing stands in the way of my long cherished ambition. Within just three days, the police had conclusively linked Cummings to two stranglings and three murders, all within streets of each other in London's West End and the evidence against him was escalating. Eager to cross-check his whereabouts, on Monday the 16th of February, Chief Inspector Greeno interviewed Cummings at Brixton Prison, stating, I'm conducting an inquiry into the murder of three women. And once again, although the prisoner was pleasant, charming and helpful, his answers were deliberately vague and evasive. Keeping a straight face as he calmly toked on a smoke, Cummings denied that he had ever been to Gosfield Street or Sussex Gardens, denied going to any flat with a West End prostitute, and denied he had ever seen the black fountain pen, the gold watch, or the silver cigarette case before. And yet, strangely, he admitted that Doris Junet's broken green-blue comb was his, even though it wasn't. And once again, confirming that his statement was true and accurate, he signed it with his left hand, as across his middle fingers were a series of bloody scabs, all of which were at least a week old. Having noticed that his scruffy black boots made an unusually flat sound as he walked, Chief Inspector Greeno asked, Are those your RAF boots? To which Cummings nodded, grinned, and removed his size 8 boots. Whether the police had found his footprints at either of the crime scenes was irrelevant, as during that full hour that Cummings was left unsupervised, in his flat, surrounded by sleeping airmen. In an attempt to outwit the police, he had crudely cut out the rubber soles of his RAF boots, having hastily disposed of them and given no explanation why. With the interview over, Chief Inspector Greeno stated to Cummings that, tomorrow, on Tuesday the 17th of February 1942, you will be brought to Bow Street Magistrates Court and charged with murder. Remaining calm, composed, and almost cocky, Cummings replied, I'm to be charged with murder. Oh. Only to casually inquire, how many women did you say? To which Greeno replied, three. And as Cummings was led away to his cell, a smug grin spread across his face, knowing there were four. Getting me ready to commit murder. On Tuesday the 17th of February at 10am, at the back of Bow Street Magistrates Court, Gordon Frederick Cummings was charged with the murder of Doris June. He was cautioned, but made no reply. As part of the formal process, Superintendent Frederick Cheryl of Scotland Yard's Print Bureau 
took Cummings' fingerprints and compared them to the left-handed thumbprint found on Evelyn Oatley's compact mirror, the left little fingerprint found on her can opener, and the left index finger found on the bottle and the glass of stout with Margaret Florence Lowe, all of which were a perfect match. And with Dr Davidson of Hendon Police Laboratory confirming that the 13 blood spots found on his blue RAF tunic, his blue belt and the left sleeve of his brown shirt were not Cummings' own blood, but that the blood type matched that of Doris Junet, police could conclusively link Cummings to the attacks on Greta Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy, as well as the murders of Evelyn Oatley, Margaret Florence Lowe and Doris Junet. But sadly, not Evelyn Hamilton. And yet, it was then that the police were blessed with an amazing piece of good fortune. That same day, Cummings' bunkmate, Sergeant Keith Edward Moon, was cleaning out the kitchenette that they shared in Flat 27 of St James's Close, when he discovered, secreted in the top shelf of their fridge, a silver cigarette case which Cummings had hidden during his hour of solitude, and it contained a small photograph of a pretty blonde lady, and the case was etched with the initials LW. Concerned that this may be vital evidence, the cadets conducted their own search, and at 2.30pm, Corporal Gordon Arthur Freeman found in the kitchen bin the hastily sawn off rubber soles to Cummins' black scuffed boots, a green and black pencil, and a handkerchief etched with the laundry mark of E2474. Chief Inspector Greeno asked those closest to the victims to identify two personal items found in Cummings' flat. Grieving widow Harold Oatley confirmed that the silver cigarette case etched with the initials LW belonged to his wife Evelyn Oatley, who was also known as Lita Ward, and that the black and white photo inside was of her mother Rosina. And former chemist's assistant, 14-year-old Bettina Grace Gray, confirmed that she had loaned the green and black pencil to her manager, Evelyn Hamilton, just one week before. With the handkerchief's laundry mark of E2474 verified by Thorpe Bay Laundry Company in Romford, which matched an identical set found in Evelyn Hamilton's suitcase, which had been left in her hotel room at the Three Arts Club in Marylebone, having also confirmed that the grey brick mortar found inside Cummings' own gas respirator matched the sample that the police had taken from the air raid shelter in Montague Place. The police now had more than enough evidence to go to trial, and they hoped to convince Cummings to confess. On Tuesday the 10th of March 1942, at the back of the Old Bailey, Cummings was charged with the murders of Evelyn Hamilton, Margaret Florence Lowe, Doris Junet, and the assaults on Greta Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy. To which he replied, Absurd! On Thursday the 26th of March 1942, at the back of the Old Bailey, Cummings was charged with the murder of Evelyn Oatley, to which he replied, That's ridiculous. Cummings denied all charges and gave no confession. On Monday the 27th of April 1942, 28-year-old Gordon Frederick Cummings was tried before Mr Justice Asquith and a jury of 12 men in Court 2 of the Central Criminal Court, also known as the Old Bailey. As was his prerogative, 
even in the face of overwhelming and irrefutable evidence against him. Cummins, in a mixture of either stupidity, confidence, or arrogance, gave no evidence in his defence, submitted no witnesses to back up his claims, didn't enter a plea of insanity, or put forward any mitigating factors like a history of mental illness. And facing almost certain death, he pleaded not guilty to all charges. If anything, as his face beamed bright with a contented grin, as mawkish crowds of spectators jostled in the gallery and rabid journalists jotted down his name, in a legal defence entirely funded by the British taxpayer, although brief, he actually seemed to relish his time in the limelight. In a trial which didn't even last the whole day, the jury only needed to deliberate for just 35 minutes before they came to a unanimous conclusion and found Gordon Frederick Cummings on the charge of four counts of murder, one count of grievous bodily harm and one charge of assault guilty. And although he protested his innocence, his parents put forward several legal appeals, and his wife applied for clemency, Gordon Frederick Cummings, the West End's most infamous spree killer and serial sexual sadist, who was also known as the Blackout Ripper, was sentenced to death. On Thursday the 25th of June, 1942, at a little before 9am, in the condemned man's cell in Wandsworth Prison, Cummings sat wearing itchy woollen prison issue fatigues, which caused him to shift uncomfortably, as he sat on a hard wooden chair, trapped by four cold stone walls, a barred window and a steel door. The room was cold, basic and simple. Sparsely furnished with very few comforts. Not unlike the bedrooms of the many women he had mauled, mutilated and massacred. But this time there were no knives, razors, no candle, no curling tongs and no can opener to occupy his endless hours. As all he had there was a bed with a sheet a simple wooden chair, a table with a jug of water, a bucket to defecate in, and a large wardrobe, not unlike the kind that his victims filled with hats, coats and handbags. But this particular wardrobe held a big surprise for Cummings, which even he wouldn't expect. Having declined a final meal, instead supping back a glass of brandy, whether to settle his nerves, toast his life, or celebrate his crimes, Cummings sat with his back to the wardrobe, facing the pale white wall with a sickly green hue, smoking and smirking, excitedly chatting away, as having had no company for the last three months except his own dark thoughts. He was desperate to talk, but the guards said nothing. Having written a few farewell letters, Cummings knew that today was the day of his death, and that at precisely 9am, not a minute early and not a minute late, that he would be dead. But with no clock on the wall, no watch on his wrist, and the guards motionless and silent, as the morning sun of a bright new day raised up high into the sky, time dragged slowly for Cummins, as just like his victims, he would be forced to live with the terrifying agony of never knowing when his end would come.
during those last days of his wasted life, having had many lonely nights to contemplate his killings, visualize his victims and mull over the mutilation, full of horrifying images which would haunt their families forever. Cummins often visited the prison chapel to pray for his wife, his father, his mother, his brother, his friends, and especially for himself. But he never prayed for his victims or for forgiveness. Although his visitors were few, mostly consisting of close family, police officers and a priest, never once in those three months of solemn reflection did he ever confess to his crimes. And when asked why he did it, he simply replied, I didn't. As in his mind, he was innocent. And as the morning dragged on and time seemed to stall, the more his leg jiggled, his fingers strummed and his charming facade dropped as he became even more impatient. And although he wouldn't know this, the time was just one minute to nine. In the briefest of moments, with a heavy clunk, the steel door of the cell would swing wide open, as his two flanking guards would sharply raise Cummings to his feet. In would swiftly walk the prison governor, the doctor and the chaplain, accompanied by a slight and almost debonair 30-year-old who would shackle the prisoner's hands behind his back. As Cummings would come face to face with a slim, short and unassuming man in a brown suit, with a kind face and a small wisp of hair on his head. This was Albert Pierpoint, his executioner. Just like Cummings, Pierpoint was a Yorkshireman. Just like Cummings, Pierpoint was synonymous with death. And just like Cummings, Pierpoint was charming, well-mannered and polite. And in his company, Cummings felt safe. But for those who were to die at his hands, his kindly demeanour was a false sense of security. And that's where the similarities ended. Pierpoint was a professional, whose precisely calculated, intricately rehearsed and swiftly performed executions were the epitome of efficiency designed to be as humane and painless as possible. With the time from the prisoner hearing the cell door open to their body dangling from the end of a rope, being less than 10 seconds, and as a master of his art, his quickest was seven. Unlike his victims, Cummings wouldn't suffer a horrendously painful death as a sadistic maniac slowly strangled every breath out of his trembling body, crushing his throat and his vocal cords, as with joyous glaring eyes his executioner clutched both sides of the stocking around his neck and pulled, choking every ounce of life out of him over several long, agonising and terrifying minutes. No, he wouldn't be mutilated, he wouldn't be violated, and he wouldn't be posed. His loved ones wouldn't witness his dead dangling corpse, and his burial would be simple and dignified. With Harry Allen, the executioner's assistant, having shackled the prisoner's hands behind his back, as a prison guard slid aside the large wooden wardrobe, Cummings would return to face the dark secret behind it as barely ten feet from where he stood was the execution chamber. There was no long walk and no green mile. Death had come to him. Being led into the cold stone chamber, barely forty feet wide, high and deep, 
The eerily empty room had pale green walls, a set of sprung trap doors in the centre, and a wooden beam across the ceiling, from which dangled a thick hemp rope, its end curled into a noose, measured precisely to fit Cummins' head. And as they would swiftly position Cummings onto the chalk-marked T, dead centre on the trap doors, before he could even realise where he was, a white silken hood would be pulled down over his head. The silk-lined noose would be placed around his neck. And having precisely calculated the prisoner's 5 foot 9 inch, 11 and a half stone frame, Pierpoint would remove the bolt and Cummings would drop. His six foot three inch fall, lasting less than half a second and releasing 1,000 foot pounds of energy as his motionless body was stopped from hitting the stone tile floor by the thick hemp rope which would dislocate the second and third vertebrae of his neck as fast as a foot snaps a stick. As a legal requirement, his body would be left to hang for a full hour to ensure that he was dead. And with no cheers, no joy and no applause, Cummins would be buried and Pierpoint would be paid £12. That would be the end of the Blackout Ripper. But before the strike of 9am, in his last minute alive, Gordon Frederick Cummings, the man who had terrified London's West End, brutally and savagely slaying four women and leaving two more scarred for life, continued to profess his innocence, gave no further statements and made no confession. Instead, having stubbed out his cigarette and huffing like a man who had better things to do, Cummings impatiently protests to his guards, Come on, let's get this done. And as the steel door opened, his arms were shackled, his wardrobe was slid back, his legs were secured, his head was hooded, his neck was noosed, and Pierpoint gripped the bolt. Amidst the irony that London that very morning was in the grip of an air raid, with a cacophony of sirens wailing, almost as a fond farewell to the West End's most sadistic spree killer. From underneath the heaving hood, as his terrified breath quickened, with barely a second to utter his final words, the Blackout Ripper said, Nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget to join us next week for the eighth part of the true story of the Blackout Ripper. Yes, that's right, the eighth part. As although this was technically the finale of the Blackout Ripper story, because he professed his innocence and gave no confession, I think it's only right that we re-examine this case. So next week, for the first time ever, we'll deep dive into the personal life of the Blackout Ripper, to look at his childhood, his relationships, and his life leading up to the murders, to see if there were any clues as to why he committed these murders. If you've enjoyed the Blackout Ripper story, uh, please do rate us on any social media platform and also share it with your friends. As the more listeners Murder Mile gets, the more stories I can tell and the longer this podcast can keep going. This week's recommended podcast of the week is Murderish. Hosted by Jamie, Murderish is an intriguing true crime series which delves into the minds, method and madness of murderers and those who track them. With excellent interviews from retired FBI profiler Jim Fitzgerald, who played a significant role in catching the Unabomber, Rob Demery, homicide investigator, 
and other people such as Emily Meehan, who was the daughter of the infamous Dirty John, to name but a few. So check out Murderish. Hey everyone, I'm Jamie, and I host a podcast called Murderish, which takes you inside stories of murder and other creepy events. The first episode of Murderish lets listeners be a fly on the wall for a first-degree murder trial. The story is told from a juror's perspective as I was that juror. If you are a true crime junkie and need to know every detail, you'll feel right at home with this podcast. Follow Murderish on Twitter at MurderishPod and on Facebook at Murderish Podcast. And don't worry, this doesn't mean you're a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. This week's new Patreon supporter is Coralie, whose donation to the Keep Murder Mile Alive Fund is really well appreciated. It truly helps cover the costs of research in each episode, as well as the 50 to 60 hours a week that each episode takes to write, record and edit. So every penny really is very appreciated. Coralie, in answer to your question, my preferred method of attack is a ball kick an upcut to the nose and a throat smash followed by a headbutt or if that sounds too aggressive simply rip off his wig mock his small hands tell him that he's not as rich as he thinks he is and then remind him that obama was a much better president that should work good luck a quick shout out goes out to two excellent true crime podcasts that i heartily recommend First is Red Rum Blonde. Hosted by Erin, the latest episode of Red Rum Blonde is a real kicker as she deep dives into the sinister world of Scientology and the mysterious death of Lisa McPherson. So if you love true crime with a twist, check out Red Rum Blonde. And second is Heist Podcast. Co-hosted by Matt and Simon, Heist Podcast trawls the news archives to bring you some of the world's craziest, most bizarre and baffling robberies from across the world, whether historical or topical. So if these podcasts sound perfect for you, check them out on iTunes and all podcast platforms. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Next week's episode is part eight about the early life of the Blackout Ripper. Thank you for listening and sleep well. Hello? Hello? (gasps) Hello? Hello, friends! Welcome back to Extra Mile. Uh, If you haven't been here before, uh, this is Extra Mile. This is the secret part that's on the end of each episode, uh, which most people have switched off by this point. They've gone, oh, switch it off. I don't want to hear all this outro stuff. Uh, And they don't realise that there's lots of goodies at the end. So this is just for those of you uh, who are more curious. This is for curious minds who go, hang on, why is there an extra 20 minutes at the end? It can't be a mistake. And you go, no, it's not. It's Extra Mile, where we dive into more about this episode. Um... Now, before we dive into uh, part seven of the Blackout Ripper, which I hope you enjoyed, that was a real bitch for me to write, but uh, instead of taking three days, it took five days. It was really difficult. Really difficult. As you can appreciate, there's lots of different pieces of information floating around. It's hard to keep them all in check, but I think I did it. I'm exhausted. Uh, But uh, I know why you've tuned in. You've tuned in for uh, big news of the week. Uh, which is coot news you want to know what's going on with the coot outside my window who's been a right pain in the arse this morning he's shut up for a second but you'll hear him shortly uh coot is having a real mental meltdown today um because mr and mrs coot have got baby coots oh i haven't seen them yet they're still hidden away they're kind of in the bushes but mr coot is out there batting away all these ducks and any other coots that are trying to get near and he's he he can be quite aggressive as mr coot but i can hear the little coots over there it sounds like there's there's normally between around three or six um that survive 
Um, but when you see him, I think I've posted a picture of Coot online, and he's he's kind of uh, shoe sized, and he's black with a kind of a white cap. Hence the phrase "balder balder a coot." Uh, but the little babies are like. They're barely palm sized, smaller than palm sized, and they're like they're like little black sea urchins. It's really weird. They're almost their feathers are all spiky and fluffy, and they've got really, really bright kind of red heads. They haven't got the white flash yet. It's a really bright heads, and they're really cute. So I'll tr- I'll try and get a picture for you and post it. So yeah, Don Juan Shaggy Shaggy Mc- Randy Coot uh, has been busy. And uh, they've got babies now. So, But he has been a pain in the ass all morning. I literally have had to stop every 10 seconds because he's fighting. Uh, so that's Coot Update. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> I think soon we'll probably do Coot Podcast, if you fancy that. Uh, so part seven of the Blackout Ripper. Um, so technically that was the finale because it is really the end of the Ripper story. It's the end of his life his execution but obviously because he didn't give a confession uh, and the statements he gave were bullshit he gave three statements in fact and all of them are bullshit hence we're going to go through we're going to have a look at his statements we're going to try and compare it with where we know he definitely was and try and uh, get some corroborative evidence see if there's anything that we haven't spotted yet and we're going to go back through his uh, life history we're going to do same as we've done for the victims we're going to do a cradle to grave Uh, And we're just going to look into his life and see if we can find something in there that tells us why he did what he did. I've done all the research and I've I've got pieces in my head, but I still, at the moment, I'm still not certain. He he gave away very little, so it's hard to tell. So I thought I'd tell you some interesting things about this case. Uh, Things that obviously didn't make it into this episode. Um, Now... I've mentioned on there that it was a one day trial, less than one day trial. In fact, they finished uh, the jury deliberated for 35 minutes, but they finished kind of mid afternoon. And given the fact that most court kind of start at 930 and they recess for lunch as well. That's like not really a lot of time. But then again, the uh, defense didn't put up any defense, which is which is Gordon Frederick Cummings prerogative. So it was entirely his right to say, I don't want to put any evidence forward which many people do many people do sometimes it's a way to trip up the prosecution by just not doing anything at all because you can trip yourself up by putting forward evidence that really you shouldn't have done um so less than a one-day trial um one thing i didn't put into this story because uh, there's no way to put it in i didn't want to slow down the pace so the the trial was actually restarted um this wasn't actually the trial for the murder of all those four women. So um, in order to make the trial efficient, what sometimes they do, if there's multiple murders, what the what the court will do is they'll say, OK, instead of let's trying you, instead of trying you for the murder of Evelyn Hamilton, Evelyn Oatley, Margaret Florence Lowe, Doris Yune, and the assaults on Greta Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy, which is a lot, what they say is let's do a specimen charge, which means... Um, the prosecution do, can decide which case they want to try. In this case, they decide to try um, Gordon Frederick Cummings for the murder of Evelyn Oatley because they had the most amount of evidence for that. They had fingerprints. They had just, just uh, all the stuff that he'd stolen as well. So it, 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 it was for them. It was it was their most conclusive case. So they put him on a specimen charge that said, if we find him guilty of murder of Evelyn Oatley, therefore he is guilty of murder to all these the other murders and the assaults charges as well which the defense and the prosecution agreed to um sometimes it's better for the defense to do that because if obviously if you if your prosecution fucks up on one murder if they if you've given them three or four the chances you could be caught out on the other so it's better just to lump them together and say this is a specimen charge charge me for this one murder and all of them together or just forget it so that's what they did Um, Now, during the trial, um, a gentleman called Major Ball, who was a very apt name, Major Ball, I'm amazed his surname wasn't wasn't Sup, Major Ball Sup, of the Public Prosecution's Office, uh, handed the jury a set of enlarged fingerprints to examine, okay, uh, which was found at one of the murder scenes. 
The only problem was he handed them the wrong enlarged fingerprints. And it, yes, it was still Gordon Frederick Cummings, but it wasn't from the murder scene of Evelyn Oatley. It was from... There's Coot. You stop now. It was the murder scene of Margaret Florence Lowe, which, yes, it's the same fingerprints, because the same fingerprints that were found on the... Um, can opener that was used to mutilate Evelyn Oatley was the same fingerprints that were found on the uh, glass of stout in the house of uh, Margaret Florence Lowe but he'd fucked up and therefore it was a mistrial so they had to get in a new set of jurors to come in to re-listen to everything that had been done so even though the trial was barely a day long part of that was taken up because of major balls up literally major balls up uh but uh, as you could e even the judge at the end said look there's overwhelming evidence here uh and therefore you have been found guilty he really had literally he did nothing he he gave cummins gave his a bit of his own witness testimony he stood up and like gave evidence but that was it but as we've seen before he's a very arrogant man and he believes he's entirely innocent and of his witness statements he stuck to that he was like, no, I was in bed, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, your fingerprints tell differently and the things that you have on your possession tell tell us differently. Interestingly, his, uh, his parents tried to... There was another airman around the time, not on the same base, but he was nearby, who was found guilty of assault. And it was just, it was just a, a very basic domestic, you know, between a couple. But they'd tried to charge him with Gordon Frederick Cummings murders because the par his parents and his wife and we'll go into this next week he did they did not believe that he had anything to do with it at all they thought the police had planted evidence on him which was bullshit quite clearly um so the old bailey um if ever you're in london it's a really fascinating place to go to it's just on the uh literally at the back of covent garden it's not too far away it's easy to get to it's near the thames uh it's a really beautiful building you can watch trials there if you want to i sometimes do that i i i spend many years kind of sitting in and listening into trials i, I do that at magistrates courts and as well because i just it's a, it's an interesting way to learn about people their lives and their ticks and things like that uh, but often the trials can be long and boring um uh, so if you want to go and uh, have a look at some trials um, if you want to do some um, minor assault charges go to a magistrate's court normally it's over and done with it in about an hour or two uh, and they're really good fun you can sit there and watch them or if you fancy a big old juicy murder trial don't go to the old bailey don't go to crown courts because you'll be there for weeks and you won't hear anything and it can be quite boring go to next to the old bailey is the appeals court very few people know about it. Very few people go there. You can literally watch a whole murder trial in a whole day. Literally, it's just like a day and it's done and that's it. You don't waste weeks. So it's, it's, it can be really good fun. Um, interesting, interesting fact. Um, so the old Bailey, uh, <coughs> before 1902, when th this new building was built, which is very nice, it's very grand. Um, it used to be a, a more of a wooden building that was attached to the prison, attached to Newgate Prison, which was still there up until, uh, yeah, I think, I think, was it 19, yeah, it must have been about 1902 or just before that. Anyway, uh, it, a big prison there, but next to it was uh, an outdoor execution site. There used to be gallows there all the time. Uh, so people will come down there, there'd be a spectacle, you could see people executed. Um, but Old Bailey, the original Old Bailey was there, and it was deliberately an open-air courtroom. Now this is not because law was meant to be impartial, therefore everyone's allowed to listen to it. And you could, you could kind of spectate and uh, come and listen. But because disease was so rampant around the mid-1800s especially... Um, that they would have it as open air so, so that people wouldn't get ill. But the problem was, because it was so cold and wet, they built wooden sh wooden doors on it and a roof on it as well to, to, to stop the judges getting wet. The only problem is that when they sealed it over, on in one day, during a case, 50 people contracted typhoid and died, including two judges. So after that, they had to make it an open court again. Obviously, it's not like that anymore. Um... 
I think it's very limited on the amount of people that go in. Unfortunately, they don't screen people for diseases. Um, <laughs> um, so, something else that's interesting in here. Um, Blackout Ripper took a day off. Mm. Did he notice that? Tuesday the 10th of February, he took a day off. Now, it, it, in the writing, it doesn't seem like he took a day off. Because everything crosses over and that's where things can get a little bit hazy with the blackout ripper you've noticed that sometimes i say he, it was a four-day killing spree it was a five-day killing spree i've i've put both into this series because it's hard to pin down exactly what because sunday the 8th obviously he was prowling the street looking for someone to murder and then he met margaret hamilton did he meet her before 12 o'clock did he meet her after 12 o'clock so was it sunday the 8th or was it monday the 9th we don't know therefore margaret hamilton is sunday monday evelyn oatley technically was monday tuesday now technically he murdered her on tuesday the 10th of february because they reckon that he murdered her uh sometime around one o'clock but her last day alive was Monday the 9th. Then then we've got Margaret Florence Lowe. Now, Margaret Florence Lowe's last day alive was Wednesday the 11th. But technically, she was murdered on Thursday the 12th. And then it kind of goes like that. So it's, 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 a hard, it's hard to get your head around it. But when you look at the Blackout Rippers, what he did in the evenings... He went out Sunday night, he went out Monday night, he went out Wednesday night, he went out Thursday night because we've got Doris June and Greta Haywood and uh, Catherine Mulcahy. But Tuesday the 10th, there's a gap. Now, this is what I'm researching at the moment. There's, 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 we, I very much suspect I'll be coming back to the Blackout Ripper to do an update because there's still a lot that I, are baffling me and it's what he did on his day off I find baffling. If you've already mutilated and murdered two women in two days and you would go on to murder another woman the day after that and another woman the day after that and attack two other women, why would you take a day off in the middle? Why? It's... What I want to do is, because he had those two failed attacks on Greta Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy, I want to see if there's any other attacks out there. Not murders, but attacks that failed or maybe he did murder another lady and it was you know maybe he had a different method of murdering maybe he drowned her i don't know so that's what i want to look into that uh, the, the blackout ripper's day off it's like ferris bueller's day off only not as entertaining uh, so uh, i'll be looking at that um one thing i didn't put into this episode as well um because it's uh, again it slowed down the plot uh, was his burial uh, I mentioned it but so Blackout Ripper Blackout Ripper is buried at Wandsworth Prison Graveyard which is inside Wandsworth Prison at the moment uh, it's an unmarked grave um, he was buried on top of two other prisoners who'd previously been executed uh, and around the time of his death there was uh, my notes say there was 161 uh, bodies but I believe that's up until the end of executions at Wandsworth Prison. Um, so all of their clothes, clothing was removed, uh, uh, except for a shirt uh, or a similar garment. Um, the coffin was made of very cheap pine. Uh, there were sides drilled into either side, so perforated holes, so that obviously they could decompose. Uh, quick lime was not used, which is meant to speed up uh, the decomposition process but quite why they didn't use that I really don't know this is from um, the the prison's own records about what originally they used to use uh, the plot of ground was nine feet by four feet um, and it was uh, basically they covered the coffin in, in uh, uh, one foot of earth and then some charcoal and then you get another another grave on top um and after a certain period of time those graves could be reused so basically as soon as they got enough bodies in there over a period of time they could um remove the bodies and place them elsewhere but as far as we know gordon frederick cummings is still buried in an unmarked grave sorry that was a burp in an unmarked grave uh inside wandsworth prison there's no grave number at all uh and we we don't know roughly where it is and because it's still a working prison 
uh, obviously we can't get in there and have a look at it and take pictures of it so uh, that's where he is um, now the uh, death penalty was abolished in the United Kingdom in 1965 uh, that's when it officially was abolished um, although the execution chamber itself at Wandsworth Prison was uh, the last one and it was still kept in working condition until 1997 uh, because they still had it that if if you were convicted of treason then up until 97 you could still be executed that's now been entirely abolished now but the condemned man's cell at Wandsworth Prison is still there today and it's been turned into a prison warder's tea room Oh, how lovely. Uh, the execution chamber itself is no longer used. Um, there was a documentary recently saying that they were planning to reuse it um, uh, for education. Uh, not to do it as a, um, look, this is what the execution cell used to be, just as an, uh, as an education room, really. So they're, they're really not trying to advertise it at all. And you can't visit it as well. Um, as I mentioned at the end... Um, Gordon Frederick Cummings' body, after he'd been hung, had been left to hang for an hour. Um, that was still the standard practice in 1942, but it was discontinued in 1947. Basically, after that point, uh, they would get a doctor to come immediately over, check him. If, the vital, if he still had vital signs, they would leave him to hang. Um... Because some people, even though their neck was broken and they were strangling, they would, st they would still be alive like 20 minutes later. I know they say it's a very humane way to die, but it's not. It's like if, you, if your neck gets snapped quickly and it severs your, your spinal cord, fantastic, because that shuts off basically all of your breathing and everything and you're dead within seconds. But if it breaks your neck but doesn't snap your, your spinal cord then you're still alive for that period of time, which is pretty grim. So um, did Cummings die immediately? We don't know. Did it take him 20 minutes to die? Hopefully. Um, and mentioned at the end as well, uh, I said that there were air raid sirens. Uh, air raid war uh, There was an air raid warning going on. There were air raid sirens happening as Cummings was executed. Now, this, we're not, I can't find any evidence of this at all. This is what's written in the papers. If you look at all the papers, you will say that it, you'll see that it says that there was an air raid going on at the time of Cummings' execution, which is a nice, nice bit of pathos in there. Do you know, it kind of, do you know, he's the blackout ripper, and there was an air raid siren going off as he was being executed. Um, I can't find any evidence of this at all, which is not to say it didn't happen, because air raids weren't recorded uh, the only things that were really recorded was bombings obviously when a bomb dropped there was a, a record made of where it dropped what time it dropped etc but air raids were constant and there were false alarms as well uh, so whether this actually happened or whether this was a bit of journalistic bravado or you know whether whether someone was like oh the blackout rip is about to be executed and they set off a, a, an air raid siren at, a, at nine o'clock who knows but you know what, this is rare for me to do this, but I left it in as I thought it was just a nice touch of the dramatic to end his life. But whether it really happened, we don't know. Poor. That was part seven of the Blackout Ripper. Hope you enjoyed it. And join us again next week for part eight. Oh. Catch you soon. Bye.